Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about the equations of motion, sometimes affectionately referred to as the SUVAT equations. We're going to talk about how to apply these equations in one dimension to uh, mathematically talk about how our kinematics uh, quantities are related, displacement, acceleration, velocity, and time. So, of course, these uh, are equations that talk about the kinematics quantities. They're equations that let us talk about motion. The one thing you really need to be aware of as you're using these equations to solve problems is there are limitations. Uh, you can't use these in every problem where there's velocity or displacement. Um, sometimes you need other methods. So the limitations are you need to be dealing with constant acceleration. Uh, that's what we mean by uniformly accelerated motion means the acceleration is constant, it doesn't change. So it's always the same. Common one is a vertical problem where the acceleration is always g, like 10-ish meters per square second, uh, negative. Um, zero does count, so if you have an object moving at constant speed, that is for sure a constant acceleration of zero. And what we mean by that, of course, if we think about f equals ma, is that we're dealing with a constant force acting on an object of fixed mass, so we're not dealing with like a rocket ship or anything like that. Uh, or at least we're not dealing with the changing mass of the rocket ship if we are. We're also, these equations only work in one dimension at a time. They have a direction. Everything has a direction, and that direction is positive or negative. So right or left, or up and down, positive x or positive y. So we can only work in one dimension at a time, and we're only ever going to work horizontally or vertically. We can combine them. We will save that. Uh... Maybe for next year, but we'll save that for a little while. For now, we're just going to be looking at one-dimensional problems. You can do two-dimensional problems with these, or more, but you can only ever work in one dimension at a time. All right, let's look at where this first equation at least comes from. The idea is, if I have uniformly accelerated motion, that means I have a constant acceleration. So if I were to look at, say, a velocity versus time graph, I would expect... A straight line with a constant slope. So here we have some positive acceleration. I am constantly increasing my velocity at a constant rate. So this would be uh, whatever object this is describing, uh, the equations of motion should apply to it. What I can do is say, hey, that's a straight line. I can do some y equals mx plus b stuff. I bet I can make a useful y equals mx plus b style equation. So let's think about what those things these are just generic math variables. Nobody likes that. So let's actually make them mean something by saying, what is y? Well, in this case, y is velocity. That's what I'm representing on the y-axis. So y is velocity and x is time. So a better way to write this equation to represent what's actually going on here is velocity equals m times time plus b. So we're halfway there, but of course we want to get the other two things in here the slope and the y-intercept and think about what they physically mean. And then we can really put some the meaningful equation together. Remember y-intercept is defined as the value of y when x equals zero. In other words, it's the velocity at time t equals zero. We could call that initial velocity. So my initial velocity is the y-intercept and because we have v for velocity, what we like to do is use lowercase u for initial velocity, because why not? So u will be a variable for initial velocity, v for right now velocity. Velocity is a function of time. And of course, we know the slope of this graph is the acceleration. So for m, for slope, I can write a. So we can substitute those things in. The y-intercept is my initial velocity. The slope is my acceleration. Now I have an equation that tells me how velocity relates to a whole bunch of interesting physics-y things. And just to make it pretty, we're going to rearrange and do v equals u plus at. And that is the first kinematics equation as you will see it in your data booklet. My velocity at a certain point in time is equal to the initial velocity plus the acceleration times time. All right, the other equations are given to you, and the, they're all given to you in the data booklet. Um, they come from a little bit of calculus and some other things and derivations that go on. You don't have to worry too much about where they come from. If you can picture this first one, that's great in terms of that graph we just looked at. But what you really need to know is this. These are the equations. Um, 
the five variables are represented here initial velocity velocity acceleration and time and displacement and you'll notice the one thing you want to notice about these equations each one has four out of the five variables and each one is missing one specific one so this one doesn't have displacement in it this one doesn't have v velocity in it this one doesn't have time in it and this one doesn't have a acceleration in it so depending on what you have and what you need you can choose the equation that's best for the situation you have right if you don't have the displacement and you don't care about finding the displacement you would use this first equation so you want to use that you're going to list out the variables that you have and what you need to find that'll help you decide what equation to use All right, so when you're solving these problems, keep in mind you are only working in one dimension at a time, so you got to look at vertical values only or horizontal values only. Some values that will always be the same. Vertical acceleration will always be g unless uh, somebody tells you otherwise, like there's a vertical force being applied or you're on the moon or whatever. If it's not stated, you assume the acceleration is g. A lot of times you can just get away with 10, honestly, negative 10. Sometimes they'll even say in the IB, assume G is negative 10 and it makes your life easy, especially if it's like a paper one where you don't get a calculator. Uh, but you can assume 9.8 or 9.81. To be honest, it's not going to make much of a difference once you round. Uh, but make sure it is negative. That's very important because the acceleration due to gravity is down and we're assigning down as negative. All right, so that's the point here. Be very careful with signs. This is the most common mistake with any kind of kinematics problem is not being careful with your signs. So whenever, if you're dealing with a uh, vertical, anything going up is positive, anything going down is negative. And if you're dealing with hor or, yeah, horizontal, anything going left is negative, anything going right is positive. You can choose to flip those at any point if it makes sense to you, if it makes you more comfortable, if it makes your life easier math-wise, and you can see how that works. As a general rule of thumb, though, stick with those rules and you'll always be consistent. All right, so here's some examples of this method. The method I encourage you to use as a SUVAT table. You make a table, list the values that you know, list the value that you need, and it'll be very clear then what you need to do to solve. So here you have a very basic problem where a car moves horizontally with a certain speed that suddenly applies their brakes and stops after a certain time. And we want to find the acceleration. So here's how I always set these up. I list out SUVAT, the five variables, and I fill in what I got. All right, so first one's easy. My initial speed is 26.8 meters per second. Obviously, be careful with these velocities because I have an initial velocity and a final velocity. So since I have an initial velocity of 26.8 meters per second, I'm going to choose to call that positive. I'm imagining this moving to the right, and they give us the time as well. You always need three values to solve these problems, so there must be a way for me to implicitly figure out a third value and figure out a number that's kind of embedded in the question. And that would be that the car stops, which means its final velocity will be zero. The other thing I like to do is to mark, uh, ideally with color or some kind of variable or question mark, whatever makes you happy, but mark the unknown variable that you're looking for, right? We want to find the acceleration, so this is what I'm solving for. And that tells me that it doesn't matter what displacement is. I really don't care because I have these three things. I need to find acceleration. If I look at my data booklet and I look at my four equations of motion, I will see that this is by far the best one because I can solve this for A. I know the three other values. So it's just a matter of isolating and solving. Do so you want to isolate for A? Do always do your algebra first before you plug in any values. Number one, you'll get credit for doing that. Number two, it will reduce any math errors you might make. So we do zero minus 26.8 divided by 2.5. I get negative 10.7 meters per square second. It should make sense. Oh, and you always want to think through whether your sign and answer makes sense that I have a negative acceleration because I'm slowing down and I started going with a positive velocity. All right, and of course, I'm going to round my answer to three sig figs because that's the smallest number of sig figs given to me in the problem. Here's another one. Uh, notice they only give me one variable, uh, one value. So we'll have to be uh, thoughtful about how we approach this, but it can be done. If you like, give the video a pause and give this a shot on your own. 
and now we'll go through the solution. Same thing, I'm gonna make a table. Now this is a vertical problem. So there's some things I know right off the bat. But they tell me it's thrown with a speed of 12 meters per second vertically upwards. So we're gonna call that positive 12 meters per second for my initial velocity. The other value that I know is the acceleration because it's a vertical problem. So it has to accelerate with the acceleration due to gravity. So I can plug this in. And I wanna find the maximum height. Now this is the thing that you have to think about. The idea is at the top of the motion, this thing goes up with a positive velocity, hits the top, and then comes down with a negative velocity. In between, it has to be at rest. It goes from positive to negative velocity. So in any kind of vertical problem like this, when you're at the maximum displacement, your vertical velocity is zero. You momentarily stop so that you can turn around. So those are both kind of, you know, you have to think about the problem and draw a, a sketch and figure out what's physically going on to get those two values, but those are the other two values that you need. I'm looking for maximum height, so what I want is the displacement, so I don't care about the time. That would tell me that the kinematics equation that doesn't have time is the one to pick. So I'm going to use uh, this guy and solve for s. We'll do some algebra. We'll plug in our values and we'll find that the displacement is 7.3 meters. All right, one other thing that we will have to deal with with motion is air resistance. The good news is you won't have to do any math with air resistance because it's very complicated. Um, you will just have to talk about uh, qualitatively and maybe on a graph what happens when air resistance is present. These equations assume there's no air resistance because they wouldn't work without it. When you have air resistance, there's a non-constant acceleration. And we'll talk a little bit about why. So you want to be able to define what air resistance is. It's a resistive force that is exerted by a fluid on a moving object. We have a lot of words for this that you'll hear used interchangeably. Drag, drag force, fluid resistance. They all mean the same thing. It all comes from something moving through a fluid like air or water and knocking, if you move through the air, you have to knock the air molecules out of your way so that you can move through it. That takes energy and so it slows you down. The faster you're going, the greater your velocity. I'm sorry, the faster you're going, the greater the air resistance on you is. You have experienced this if you think about driving with your hand out the window. If you're driving nice and slow, you get a nice gentle push on your hand. If you're driving on the highway, though, don't stick your hand out the car door because the faster you go, the more violently the air pushes your hand back, right? If you're going super fast and you try and stick your hand out the window, it'll get pushed back very quickly uh, by the air as it moves past you. That force gets a lot bigger as velocity gets bigger. If you are curious, here are some equations for drag. There are two types. Um, a lot of the time we're dealing with this. This is called viscous drag, whereas this is quadratic drag. Uh, but just notice both of them depend on velocity. Uh, so in a lot of cases, the drag force depends on the velocity squared. So going faster makes a big difference in terms of the drag force. And so as, the, as your speed changes, the force changes, which means things about your acceleration will change. It gets very complicated. So math-wise, you really just want to know the drag force depends on the speed. It also depends on other things that you might expect, like the cross-sectional area, as in if your hand is out the window flat versus uh, facing the wind, you get a lot more or a lot less drag, depending on the area that you show to the wind, the density of the air, and some other stuff. All right, but you don't need to know these equations. They are just there to help you see that the, it depends on the velocity. So let's look at what that would mean as I uh, drop something in the presence of air resistance is the common problem that you'll see and need to be able to graph in a motion graph. So if I release an object from rest, uh, we can think about the forces acting on the object. When I release it, there's a force of gravity, of course. The weight of the object is pulling down on the object. After some time, the object starts to move and speed up which means I'll have a drag force that appears. And that drag force increases the faster I go. As time goes on and I accelerate more, that drag force is gonna get bigger and bigger. Eventually, that drag force will equal the weight of the object 
At that point, the acceleration is zero, the forces are balanced, and now I'm going with constant speed. That's called terminal velocity, the constant speed that you reach when these forces are balanced. At this point, acceleration is zero. So since the acceleration is constantly changing, we can't do really any math on these uh, without calculus. So we're not going to worry about it. We are only going to worry about graphing this and thinking about what happens as my acceleration decreases and all these other things are going on. So what we will need to do is be able to draw motion graphs when an object falls with air resistance. And we can think about the three graphs. And really, uh, I find you can think about velocity for all of these graphs. So I know that um, my velocity increases to some maximum, right? I start at rest, I go faster and faster and faster until I hit this terminal velocity. Uh, do be careful because it would depend on how it's worded if we're talking about velocity or speed. speed. But if we want to talk about velocity, it's always negative. So it starts at zero and gets to some maximum negative value and then kind of stays at that value. So I'm going to start at zero and have to eventually flatten out to some constant terminal velocity. So it's going to be some kind of weird curve that looks like this. If I apply that to my, say, uh, acceleration graph, we can do that one next. I know the acceleration starts at negative 10 or negative 9.8 because it's only the force of gravity is the only force acting. It is in free fall. So the acceleration is going to be negative 9.8. And the acceleration decreases to 0. So this graph should look something like starts at negative 10, decreases to 0. Lastly, the displacement graph is maybe a little weird. But if I think about velocity, it helps a lot on the displacement graph. Because I know it starts from rest. So it starts with a 0 velocity, which means it starts with 0 gradient, which means a displacement versus time graph must start flat. And then it increases to some constant negative value. So I need my displacement graph to start flat, curve to be more and more and more negatively sloped, and then hit some constant negative slope, so eventually turns into a straight line. So here's what these graphs will look like. So displacement, if I think about this graph, this is showing me zero velocity, greater velocity, greater velocity, and then at the end, constant negative velocity. Same thing here, zero velocity, constant negative velocity. And here, uh, the acceleration is g, and then the acceleration eventually goes to zero because I hit a constant velocity. So if you think about velocity, that will help you with all of the motion graphs. They might be in different situations. You might not always just get an object dropped from rest. But anytime you have an object in the presence of drag, you can apply those concepts to draw your different motion graphs. That's the most EIB will ask you to do with them, because again, you can't do math. All right, so when you have constant acceleration, you uh, can deal, use the equations of motion, the SUVAT equations, make yourself a table, figure out what you got, what do you need, choose the equation that will help you, and solve for what you want. Otherwise, you can apply your kinematics concepts to all kinds of situations to help you with graphs and other things that we'll get into as we go further in mechanics. There you have it. Have fun.